No? Oh, cracky. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Thanks very much for coming. My name's Tom Fardin. I'm the chair of Grand Rounds. Um, this week, we have a double act between the Moyen Lefty, who's a consultant in renal medicine, and Claire Douglas, who's a consultant in palliative medicine. She's come all the way over from Perth to come and speak to us about the collaborative working between renal and palliative care. And without further ado, I'll hand over to Maureen. I hope you can hear me. Can you even see me over this thing? Mm -hmm. So I think that the first thing to say is that we have been really fortunate and I'm also very proud of the relationship that we've built over the last 10 years um, with Clare in particular and the wider palliative care services both here and across um, NHS Tayside. Before start, I just want to be clear about some definitions that we're, we're using in the, in the talk. When we talk about advanced chronic kidney disease, we're talking about CKD5 with an EGFR of less than 15. When, we use the te when the term renal replacement therapy is discussed, we're actually talking about dialysis and renal transplantation, but a lot of the patients, because this is palliative care, will actually be talking more about patients that are on dialysis or patients who were conservatively managed, and that's the management of advanced CKD without the use of dialysis. The other thing that, as a nephrologist, we're very fortunate to have and we're really proud of is the Scottish Renal Registry. And oops, the pioneers of nephrology started collecting data on all patients with renal on renal replacement therapy from the 1960s and it's ongoing today. And as you can see, there's been a, a massive swell in the numbers of patients um, requiring dialysis and transplantation. Tom said there was a pointer on this. Where's the pointer? Ah, there can work it. That's why we're a double act. There we go. So you can see, if I can find it, here, around right here, just got my membership very good time to pick a career in nephrology and here we are massive swell in consultant numbers one consultant in Tayside, six consultants in Tayside around the early 2000s and fortunately you can see again the number on hemodialysis has eased off which is why there's not been an ongoing expansion in consultant numbers because the patients on dialysis have, have evened off and there are now more patients in Scotland and across probably the western world whose, renal, whose end stage renal disease is treated with transplantation rather than dialysis. Where has this rise in numbers come from? I suppose fortunately for our young population there's been no significant growth in young people with end stage renal disease and the major growth has been in the older patients particularly those greater than 65 and those greater than 75. And you can see in the last few years, there's been a tailing off or even a drop in the age of the older patients commencing dialysis. And a lot of this growth was really around a challenge due to what was perceived and probably was rationing of dialysis in the, in the, in the 1980s, where the take-on rates in the UK were substantially lower than parts of Europe and the US. So this is, um, in Tayside, all our, we expect all our patients who we're looking after with progressive CKD really to have been counselled and to have made a decision about what their treatment options are round about where the GFR is about 15. we will just take you through this code um, on this audit that we, a snapshot we did last November. 6% of patients still hadn't been counselled. 3 had been counselled but hadn't yet made a decision. Hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, so home hemo. And you can see on this pale half of the graph, 50% 50 of our patients are choosing to ha not to have dialysis treatment. What that actually looks like in numbers now compared to five years ago, um, the hemodialysis population does, does fluctuate a bit, but it's dropped a bit. Currently 160 patients in in-centre hemodialysis. We've got a growing home therapies population, which is what we, what we want, better outcomes, better quality of life. Um, and you can see we've now got 50 more, looking after 50 more patients with functioning transplants, which is fantastic news for our patients. When we look at our conservative management cohort, we have 50 patients 
at the moment who we have been identified as not for dialytic, dialytic treatment therapy should the renal disease progress that far. At the moment, 30 of those have a GFR of less than 15 and 10 have a GFR of less than 10, 11 of them GFR of less than 10. And the age range is really wide. We've got a, um, 56 to um, 100. And the, the younger patients tend to have either maybe severe learning difficulties or um, perhaps a progressive neurological disease, while our older patients is often comorbidity or frailty. What's the survival if you've got advanced chronic kidney disease? Well, it's pretty, pretty horrendous. Um, this is from the Scottish Renal Registry report in 2010, and the pink dot is the expected years to survive if you're um, all in the general population of Scotland, and you know that we're not the longest survivor as a nation, but even still, if you look at the cohort, and it is a wide range cohort from patients from 1960, and obviously our outcomes are better now than they were um, 60 years ago, but the, the, the years to live for somebody in the under 20 is dramatically reduced compared to the general population, quite a, a horrific um, graph, and for every age group that you're in, your expected survival is significantly reduced if you have end-stage renal disease. Back to the Scottish Renal Registry. With the other advanced Scottish Renal Registry, we are benchmarked across Scotland across a whole variety of topics. This is our five-year standardised mortality for cohort patients starting um, renal replacement therapy, and that's dialysis and transplantation for these years. And you can see that our centres bang on the middle were neither too high or too low in this particular graph. Interestingly, our one-year survival um, um, in this population is actually down here, so we're perhaps doing something different. Just point out again that the mortality for, for this cohort of patients for, for the first, for first five years was 53%. So our patients are not living long once they have this diagnosis. And if we look down, at, if this is from the UK Renal Registry, about the survival for, broken down into age bands. Oops, sorry. We can see that there's a huge difference between the age ranges. 85% at 10 years for um, our younger, the youngest cohort to less than 5% at 10 years for the oldest cohort. Um, I'm putting this up, and it doesn't, the graph doesn't project very well, but um, just the, the byline to this, that's a statistically significant trend that our survival is improving at 90 days, one year, two years, and five years for the most recent uh, co cohort of patients. And that might mean that we're delivering dialysis and transplantation better, but it also might mean that our population and who we're putting forward to these therapies has changed as well i.e. we were selecting patients differently. So, um, to look at our older populations as a retrospective study, looking at patients who elected to have either conservative treatment or renal replacement therapy, which in this group would have been dialysis. Um, this is from Lister. And you can see, fortunately, for nephrologist, dialysis does make you live longer compared to not dialysis. However, when they looked down at, when they broke it down into patients with low comorbidity and high comorbidity, again, low comorbidity group dialysis definitely made you live longer. However, in the high comorbidity group, there was no difference initially, and there was a small cohort of patients who actually treated conservatively and um, lived longer. Um, and obviously, they, because it's retrospective, they don't have performance scores and they don't have sort of hospital days. But we know that patients on dialysis have considerably more hospital days than um, conservatively managed patients. Another audit the Scottish Renal Registry um, collects is uh, the SMART audit, which is looking at. Um, deaths of patients on renal replacement therapy. We collect various bits of data, but one of the things they look at is cause of death. And I'll just draw this option to you where patients are electing to with, withdraw from, from treatment it's due to a variety of reasons, including complications, malignancy, infection. But when the group analysed the free text um, 
data uh, around those patients that have withdrawn. We've created a world of some of it, um, patient choice, cognitive impairment, access-related issues are running out of dialysis, unable to tolerate treatments, um, and just sort of um, failing and various other, other issues about why they would choose to withdraw treatment. So, which renal you know, patients have palliative care needs? You could probably predict this. Obviously, this, partly this journey started when we made a sort of a patients that having non-dialytic treatment was a valid and positive choice, so they need to, to have a patient pathway to manage. As I've alluded to, patients on dialysis who choose to stop dialysis. Patients who are deteriorating despite dialysis, and that might be comorbidity, the elderly, overwhelming complex symptoms, which Claire will talk to you more about, or where a crisis occurs that can happen to any of us, stroke, cancer, or other, another severe illness. So how did we start? Well, um, again, I was very fortunate. I was asked to start a, 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 a clinic just for conservative management patients, and at that time Fiona McFatter had elected to come and spend some time as a, as a trainee in, in, the, in, the, in the renal unit to get some experience, and she was really helpful about me setting up um, a, using a symptom score and performance status. Um, and that was purely for clinics. And then I was very fortunate that Claire came to Tayside as a trainee and also decided she wanted to come to clinic, and they really kept, kept us on the, on the right path. And in 2010, we, um, from the renal budget, um, got a formal um, session for a palliative care consultant, which was Claire. And at that time, all we were doing was a, a Dundee-based um, conservative management clinic. Um, we recognised that we were not, there was not equity, we were not, if patients didn't want to travel to Dundee for a clinic or if they're too frail to come to clinic, we weren't really able to, to, to look after those patients. So we applied to the British Kidney Patients Association and we were successful in getting a part-time renal supportive care nurse and an extra PA for Claire really just to push the service forward. By 2016, we had a weekly conservative management clinic, which is just run by myself and a supportive care nurse without Claire now, because eventually she thought I could be let loose on my own. We have um, a whole, one whole time equivalent of a supportive care nurse, but that's two, two roles. Um, and they are see, work with Claire and me in clinic. Claire now does an alternate weekly dialysis clinic, seeing patients with really complex symptoms, we were able to provide domiciliary support, we were able to go into the satellite, satellite dialysis units and the renal supportive care nurses attend low clearance clinics across Tayside making sure our patients have equity of access. We undertake MDT meetings looking at both dialysis patients and particularly focusing on domiciliary patients who do not have a nephrology or palliative care consultant input and ongoing education from Claire and the sports care nurses for the, for the team. So what does a renal physician bring to renal supportive care? Well, we're a name consultant, and as many of you know, we probably often act as almost like a primary care physician coordinating care, referring on and managing the patient's care. We highlight, highlight with, the te with our team patients that are at risk of um, dying or, or developing symptoms. Um, and we provide specific management of the renal disease and hopefully with some realistic goal setting about what we might be able to achieve. What does the palliative care physician bring to renal supportive care? Well, skills and symptom assessment and skills and symptom control support with advanced care planning conversations and one of the key things is education to the renal health care professionals to allow us to practice independently in some of these roles and to know when to seek um, advice for more complex symptoms. But of course it's much more complex than that and it's much more intertwined and with that I'm going to hand over to Claire. So, um, as Maureen said, I've been working with the renal team for about 10 years, and um, 
But there's still a, a perception from some of the public and some healthcare professionals where they still think palliative care is really for people with advanced cancer who are maybe in the last weeks or so of life. Um, and obviously that's not the case. Only 25% of people die from cancer. The remainder die of other conditions, many of them of long-term chronic conditions. And it's estimated that within Scotland there's probably 10,000 people die per year with unmet palliative care needs. So the government has recognised this and released the strategic framework for palliative care in 2015 with the vision that all people who have palliative care needs across Scotland will have those needs met no matter what their condition is and where they are, whether they're in the acute setting or whether they're in the community. Realistic medicine has also developed what I would say is a, a degree of a palliative approach, which is what we try to practice and have been for many years, with shared decision-making between professionals and patient and family, with a personalised approach to care, and trying to reduce harm from interventions that a patient may not want or may not benefit from, or active treatment but a palliative approach alongside active treatment. So what do people with chronic kidney disease want as they approach maybe the last months, years of life? They really want what anybody with an advanced cancer or with probably with any long-term condition wants. They want good symptom relief. They don't want to be a burden to their loved ones. They want to avoid life-prolonging treatments if those are not going to benefit them. And they want to be with loved ones when they die. So in the supportive care service, we do have a big focus on symptoms and on recognising that a person might be approaching their last years or months of life. I was always taught as a junior doctor and a medical student that dying of kidney failure was a good death because it was asymptomatic. And the evidence does not um, support this. So this was a, a study that was done, a prospective study, following conservatively managed patients over a 23-month period and looking at their symptom burden. And as you can see, it's very high, and it's certainly equit um, equitable with people with advanced cancer in their last months of life. And starting dialysis doesn't necessarily change those symptoms. This is the results of a systematic review looking at patient symptoms who are managed by dialysis. And what we do know from the research is that these symptoms are often unidentified or even if they're identified, they're unmanaged. And part of that is due to a lack of training in symptom control and the, the fear, the real fear of drug toxicity for many of the drugs that we use for symptom control. So when we see people in the supportive care clinic, we use a, a tool called the IPOS, that's the Integrated Palliative Outcomes Scale. And this is a validated tool used for people with cancer and non-cancer. And part of it is looking at their symptoms, but it also looks at their psychological needs as well, so that we can focus really on what's important to the person. And also we can then follow up to see whether interventions and drugs that we use are effective. Another significant part of the work we do is advanced care planning, which obviously many of you will be doing. But really, advanced care planning is just thinking ahead to what's going to happen and what a patient wishes as their health predictably will deteriorate. It's an honest conversation or a series of conversations over time to try and help that person plan what they, they would want in the future. And it incorporates this patient-centred um, care that realistic medicine is also promoting. There's debate about who's the best person to have these conversations. It could be their primary care um, physician or nurse, or it could be somebody within the acute setting who knows that patient well, but probably a collaborative approach is best. We know that for people who have advanced care planning, they're less likely to die in hospital, more likely to have their end of life wishes respected, and there's less anxiety and depression for their families and carers. 
particularly in the bereavement time. However, they are they can be difficult conversations and they do require a degree of time and they're more likely to occur if they're delivered by staff who are trained to facilitate these conversations. And why is it important? Well, as you are all fully aware, we have a growing ageing population with advanced comorbidity in that population. And most people still die in Scotland in the acute hospital setting, although some of that is improving. In this study by um, David Clark in Glasgow, this took, um, he looked at 25 acute hospitals and all the patients who were in, that, in those hospitals on one specific date a few years ago in March, and then followed all those patients, over 10,000 of them, for a year, and found that almost 30% of those patients died within that year. So the acute hospitals are dealing with people who are in their last year of life a lot of the time, but we don't always recognise that those patients are at that stage and therefore they often lose the opportunity to have advanced care planning conversations. So why is there a barrier to pal a palliative approach in non-malignant disease? Well, there is this difficulty in recognising that a person may be in their last months or year of life. There's a perception that having an honest conversation about deteriorating health might remove hope for the patient. There's a lack of skills in symptom management and communication skills or specialist palliative care resource to support this. And there's uncoordinated care between primary and, and secondary care. And probably one of the big things is that there's this perception that we need to know what the prognosis is of a person before we can start planning for their deterioration. But, but recognising or being accurate about how long somebody may live for is very difficult. It's what we do a lot and we get it wrong. You'll be familiar probably with these graphs, but this, this one here, on the y-axis we have performance status or the function of what a person can do, and the x-axis is over time. And this trajectory is the cancer trajectory. Somebody with advanced cancer can be functioning at a relatively high level, but as their disease progresses, they start to decline. They need a bit more care. They're able to do less. And we can say with a relative accuracy that they might be in their last months of life. But the non-malignant trajectory is much less easy to predict at which point a person who's come into hospital with a, a severe decline in their function because they've had an acute exacerbation of something it's much more difficult to say that that person is dying because they get treated and they improve, um, maybe not to the same function, but gradually over time they're deteriorating and at one of these points they will actually die. And so we probably need to be more focused on the fact that we know that over time the person will deteriorate and less worried about at what specific time that person has got left. And so within the kidney population, this could be somebody who has vascular access problems, who's got difficult symptoms on dialysis, and they get treated, but they still have pa palliative care needs. And certainly a couple of the patients I've been seeing have actually gone ahead and had transplants successfully. So it's not that they need to be in their last months or year of life. So what triggers should we look for for people who may require a palliative approach? Well, unplanned hospital admissions, where they've got performance status that is poor or deteriorating with increased care needs, or they have persistent symptoms despite optimal management of their underlying condition. Or a person or their family may request that they want to stop treatment or they don't want to start treatment and want to focus just on quality of life and symptom control. So are we making a difference? Well, we wanted to know was this palliative approach and joint integrated working making a, ben making a difference to the patients? So we've started looking at the patients who are managed conservatively from the supportive care service. 
and we did a retrospective evaluation over a 30-month period of the patients who were known to the renal team in that time who had chosen conservative care and wanted to look at their symptom burden and then the effect of advanced care planning. We used the renal database to identify the patients and then collected data retrospectively from their notes and from the database, clinical portal, anything else from the emergency care summary or key information summary. And specifically, we wanted to see what supportive care input they'd had, what their symptom burden score was, and the effect on advanced care planning. During that time, 98 patients were being managed conservatively. As predicted, they were mainly quite old, and more of them were female. And after they'd made the decision to be managed conservatively, their first, um, at their first consultation, their mean EGFR was 13. And we were seeing patients from across NHS Teesside because by this point we had the renal supportive care nurses in place. So, 72% of those patients who had opted for conservative care had renal supportive care input and consultation. So this, this resulted in 507 consultations, many of whom came to a renal supportive care clinic, but some patients got other forms of consultation with a domiciliary visit and or a telephone conversation. The symptom burden for the patients was in, fit, in, in keeping with the previous research that's been done. They have a significantly high symptom burden. Most patients have several symptoms and only one patient had no symptoms. But if they were seen by the supportive care service, there was a significant reduction in their total symptom burden between their first consultation with us and the most recent one in the, in the evaluation period. For the patients who, had, um, who were seen by the supportive care service, 79% of them had an advanced care plan, compared to only 19% of the patients who had just their normal renal um, input and didn't see the supportive care service. When we say an advanced care plan, what we did was we um, electronically communicated with the GP um, on the letter, there was a section that was titled Advanced Care Planning, and then within that it had um, information about DNA CPR, preferred place of care, and any other important relevant information. During our evaluation period, the key information summary was um, implemented by the Scottish Government, and we would ask the GP to then upload that information onto the key information summary. DNA CPR was documented um, and communicated in 84% of the patients with supportive care input compared to 47% without it. And preferred place of care was documented um, for 68% compared to 26% without supportive care input. During the evaluation period, 62% of the, of the 98 patients died. And what we could see was that 48% who did not have a preferred place of care documented and electronically communicated died in the acute hospital setting compared to 24% of the patients that did have this communicated. So what we concluded from the conservatively managed patients is that we, if they are seen by the supportive care service, there is an improvement in their symptom burden despite the fact they have a progressive illness and despite the fact that many of them are dying and that there's improved documentation around advanced care planning and that those patients who have this documented may avoid hospital admission at the end of life. So within the UK we know that there are pockets of, of, of places where there, the renal patients who are being managed conservatively are having access to palliative care. Most of this is community. There's not so many examples of very integrated clinical working, but we know that the patients who are on dialysis have less access. So this study from Leeds 
looked at over 400 patients whose EGFR was less than 20 and followed them and found that um, the patients were managed conservatively. 76% had access to community palliative care, but for those who chose dialysis, none of them accessed community palliative care, despite the fact that 20% of them died before they'd even started dialysis. And we know that dialysis patients actually want to have advanced care planning conversations, but that this doesn't always happen. So this study by Sarah Davidson from Canada showed that in over 500 dialysis patients, 83% of them wished to be prepared and plan ahead in case of death, but 91% had never had a conversation with their doctor about prognosis and planning ahead. So most of the work, as Maureen has said, that I now do is with the dialysis patients and we'll still see conservative patients, but really only the most complex ones because Maureen and the renal supportive care nurses and the renal team are, are excellent at managing symptom control and advanced care planning. So this is just an example of, of somebody that we were involved with. This is a young, a young lady, AM, who started dialysis at the age of 29 for polycystic kidney disease. She'd had a very difficult upbringing. Her mother was a drug user and had introduced her to drugs at a very early age and she'd, become, uh, she'd started using heroin. She'd eventually managed to get off this and was on the methadone programme. But she had chronic hepatitis C, she had comorbidity, and as a result, she was not on the transplant list. She also had significant problems with difficult vascular access. And when I was asked to see her, it was really because of pain control. She had been um, referred to the um, chronic pain team, but had really struggled to try to get to those clinics on top of getting to dialysis. Although I was asked to see her for for pain, and at that time she had very severe bilateral sciatica. She also had other problems. She hadn't managed to get up the stairs to her bedroom for a year, and she was sleeping on the couch or not sleeping. She had significant insomnia, severe fatigue, and overwhelming pruritus. She had nausea, vomiting, and constipation, and she had severe anxiety and depression with agoraphobia as well. So her total symptom burden on the IPOS was 28, which is very high. She was on methadone, um, but she had to go to the chemist daily, which was a very difficult journey for her, to drink the liquid in front of the, the chemist. She had diazepam for her anxiety, ondansetron for her nausea, clonazepam for some of her pain, and piritin for her itch. Um, she was on no laxatives and she wasn't on an antidepressant at the time that I met her. She was also on a host of, the, of renal drugs. As I mentioned, she had a very difficult, chaotic family background. Her mother was still using drugs and was of no support to her at all. Her big sister had committed suicide and her patient blamed the antidepressants for that. And although she had a partner when I asked how she got on with them and was he supportive, she cried and said that they didn't really talk properly. She hated dialysis and I asked her why she was doing it and she said for her son who was 12 years old at the time. So her main issues were a very heavy symptom burden, significant psychological and social needs and the fact that she was doing dialysis for her son but really hated it and was struggling with vascular access. So working jointly with the, the renal team, alongside them, we found that she had actually discitis. She was treated with IV antibiotics, but the pain returned a few months later, and it was very much pain management. Managed to liaise with the substance misuse team and say that we really wanted to use the methadone for pain and that she didn't need to try and get to the chemist. So we got this in tablet form, delivered so that she got it delivered by the pharmacist in tablet form twice a day that she could take it and we could titrate it upwards for pain along with other analgesics. Her nausea resolved with res regular laxatives and using haloperidol which is better in uremic nausea and the uremic itch that people with, that, with renal failure get doesn't respond to antihistamines because it's not a histamine related itch, 
but it did respond to Depribase and Mirtazapine. And we rationalised her medication so that she was less drowsy. So after 12 months of seeing her on a, a relatively regular basis, her total symptom burden had fallen from 28 to 8. We got a bed down the stairs for her, which really was with the liaison with the community team. But she remained quite depressed and anxious. This improved a bit with mirtazapine and by regular counselling sessions from the supportive care team. But she didn't want to see clinical psychology, unfortunately. And she did have significant flashbacks to her horrific childhood that she'd had um, insomnia and agoraphobia as a result of that. Over the next four years, we saw her on a, an intermittent basis, sometimes just open appointments and sometimes at a more regular basis. But over that period of time, her performance status was starting to deteriorate and she was having significant problems with vascular access and such that a, a clot had developed in her graft and she was then dialysing through a temporary tunnelled line. There was options being discussed between the renal team and the vascular team about high-risk complex surgery to, to develop another hero graft with a big risk of either losing a limb or um, significant steel syndrome. And we had our MDT discussion and I was able to bring up the fact that actually she really didn't like dialysis and that we should be offering her the choice of saying what she really wanted because she was one of these vulnerable people who would just sometimes go along with the flow of things. So we did a joint consultation with her where it was made very clear that she had options of trying this high-risk surgery or stopping dialysis when that line failed, if that was what she wished, knowing that she would then die. And her decision was that she didn't want surgery. She would continue dialysis until the line failed. We then discussed the NACPR, preferred place of care, and what she wanted was to be at home as much as possible, but at the point that she stopped dialysis, she wanted to die on the renal unit because she felt very safe there and very um, secure with the staff who she knew well. Sarah, our renal supportive care nurse, went out to her house to speak to her son and husband and support them with this decision making. And then prior to her line actually failing, the patient herself decided that she wanted to stop dialysis and this was all planned for, withdrawn, and she was admitted to the renal unit to have her end-of-life care. She died peacefully in the renal ward, and afterwards, bereavement support was offered by the renal supportive care team for the staff who'd known her for a long time. So what did the supportive care service offer? Well, a big focus on symptom control to try and improve the symptoms despite the fact that she was deteriorating, liaison with substance abuse, significant psychological and family support, and then support with advanced care planning, decision making and communication. I think one of the key things also was just the support for the renal staff and the education around her needs and her symptom and psychological needs. So in summary, the palliative care needs in advanced chronic kidney disease are high. Collaborative approach is essential, I would say. It's not that palliative care take over, it's that we work together and some people will be having very active management and others will be very much towards the end of life. And that this um, optimal renal management can occur alongside a palliative approach. And really this the joint collaborative working and shared decision making really fits with the, the vision for realistic medicine. Thank you. That's, uh, that's great work and a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, one thing that's struck me is that you call this the supportive care, not palliative care. And that's um, one of the stumbling blocks for, for me with the cystic fibrosis patients particularly, uh, the patients that spring to mind who have a huge symptom burden. And as soon as you mention palliative care, then there's the proverbial antibodies and I'm not dying, I'm not dying, I'm not dying. Whereas you've, did you deliberately call it a supportive care service rather than palliative? Was that the, was that the thought yeah. process? So I think it was initially from conservative management 
Approach the bench. <laughs> I'll give you a step up. Um, it was initially for um, conservative management. I didn't like the term conservative management from a, pers- uh, a patient pr- perspective, and it's not political. It just doesn't kind of see what it does on the tin, because um, that's the terminology that's used in medical parlance. But, I mean, renal supportive care is recognised within the renal community, and it just, I think, fits across the spectrum wherever our patients are. Supportive care, it doesn't actually matter what therapy you're on mm-hmm. so, um, and when we're introducing it so, so for example at the time we are doing it ourselves but if we're saying that we would like to refer to, to Clear or to the other um, it's obviously Angus patients are supported by the Angus palliative care physician we, we say it's because they're experts in symptom control and it's about living not dying it's about trying to live as well as possible with the burden that you've got yep. yeah I think just to add though, I don't pretend I'm not a palliative care doctor though. No. You know, so I think it's quite because I say and as Morning said, it's very much focused on what we do, but it's not all about dying. Yeah. yeah. I mean we um we have a we have an interesting challenge in respiratory medicine, we have a lot of re- recurring patients and anyone who's worked in AMU will know you, know, you see the same faces again and again and, and if you look at those recurring patients, the mortality within six months is about fifty percent. These are very, very sick people who have a huge symptom burden and no reserve, yeah. and they have nowhere else to go, so they get readmitted, and, and it's a real, a real challenge, something that we, we in respiratory medicine need to learn from the renal service, so how we can improve this. But it's a, we have a, it's a huge burden for us, a huge burden. Has anyone got any questions from the floor? I can turn this on. No? Everyone happy? Yeah? Okay, then. well, that's it, then. <laughs> You're a little way scot free. Relatively scot free. Okay, next week, um, Rod Mountain is coming back to talk about uh, design led healthcare with particular focus on the V&A and the impact that it's going to have culturally, and but also the impact it might have on healthcare. Um, he's bringing some local experts along. He's bringing some folk across from Duncan and Jordison to talk about design. And uh, if you've heard, if you've not heard him talk about this stuff, he's so enthusiastic about design and how it can impact on healthcare. It's really worth coming to see him. He's um, he's got some very interesting anecdotes and stories about what he's learnt, um, including going off to learn sculpture at the uh, Duncan and Jordison. So, please come along to that. Thanks very much to our speakers. Thanks for coming along, and I'll see you all next week.